To start this patch note video off for Xbox One and PlayStation 4, the update size is 3.6 gigabytes, but on Nintendo Switch it is 4.1, which means Warframe's game size has exceeded the base storage capacity of the Nintendo Switch, so if you do want to play the update you will have to have an SD card and at least 4.21 gigabytes of free storage to start the download. DE has stated that they will in the future do a remaster update to bring the game size below the base capacity, but for this update you will need the aforementioned extras. Like usual, I have recorded this footage on the PC version of the game, but the information remains accurate as it has been taken from each of the console's patch notes and any console specific information has been specifically noted throughout. Now each user who logs into the game before the 20th of January 2020 at 11.59pm Eastern Time will receive 3 former and a 7 day affinity booster. But for those who have had an account before the 18th of October, and if that account is above Mastery Rank 3, you'll also receive a Legendary Core. At the moment of recording, only information about the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 post-release alerts are alive, so for Nintendo Switch you will have to check the patch notes once the update does go live for you guys. But for once again, for Xbox One and PlayStation 4, you have alerts that are currently running in the game right now. These alerts reward three former, a Grendelin Action Glyph, and one of each new Requiem Relic. Grendel is live and can be purchased from the in-game market by itself or via the Grendel Collection as it contains Grendel, the Alternate Glut Helmet, the Sumba Sign Dunner, the Signature Melee Weapon, the Masseteer, and a 3-day Affinity and Credit Booster. For free-to-play players, you can acquire Grendel via unique keys found at the arbitration vendor in the Relay, which requires all nodes on the star chart to be completed in order to access said vendor. In total, there are three keys at the vendor, each costing 25 Vitus Essence, and each key has a specific part tied to it. These keys unlock nodes on Europa, where players will have to complete a mission where your mods and arcanes are disabled. Your operator will also be gone as well. Grendel's blueprint, on the other hand, can be purchased via the market for 35,000 credits. For individual purchases, you can have the Glut Helmet, the Sign Donna, and the Masseteer, but the Masseteer can be researched in the Tenno Lab at your clan dojo, and if you use the weapon with Grendel, you'll also be immune to staggers and knockdowns while using a heavy attack. As for Grendel's abilities, you have Feast, where Grendel eats nearby enemies and stores them in its gut, consuming energy. You can also spit them back up by holding it. Nourish consumes an enemy in the gut and provides a buff to nearby players within the radial cast. This is also based on player action with the ability, so the buffs can be energy, armor, or damage. Regurgitate shoots an enemy from the gut outward towards a directed target, and Pulverize can be activated once you have enemies stored in the gut, and Pulverize can be activated and turns Grendel into a ball that you control. As for a passive, it is simply 50 armor with each enemy consumed. You have also received the following changes made to that Warframe that PC received, where Grendel can cast Nourish while Pulverize is active, Grendel's Feast Expel deals increased damage based on the number and level of enemies, where it also deals the same damage as a Radial AoE, Grendel's Regurgitate damage radius has been increased to 3, 4, 5, and 5 at their respected ranks, and they have increased the damage scaling. They've also made it so Grendel's Pulverize no longer ends when he runs out of consumed targets, instead it starts to drain your energy. Grendel also has extra acceleration for Pulverize if he uses Nourish during it, and they added sounds to when Grendel stumbles due to it running out of energy. Now with the release of this update, Grendel and Atlas also have Leverian exhibits that can be accessed via their market or codex pages. Four Tenogen bundles are now available for consoles, those being Tenogen Bundle 40 that comes with Zephyr Grax, Equinox Megara, Opticor Mithra, Ton for Hades, and Scopos Polearm skins. The Tenogen Bundle 41 contains the Nova Stinger, the Atlas Arhat, Excalibur Artharius, Vault Thales, and Lisette Quillette skin. Tenogen Bundle 42 contains the Diva, Fenny Pack, and Paxis chest armors, the Voiso Oculus and Woosh Grax weapon skin. The final pack, that being Tenogen, Tenogen Bundle 43 contains Trinity Nightingale, Gara Rowan, Baruch Grax, Wisp Grax, and the Wisp Demas Alternate Helmet. Continuing with the Platinum Base purchases, the Titania Empress Deluxe Collection can be purchased in the market, and it comes with the exclusive Denrite Gunblade skin and the Heartwood armor set, which contains the shoulder pads, chest plate, and leg plates. 
You can also purchase only the skin via the market, but you will have to purchase the full collection at a later date if you want the Gunblade or armor set. With the release of the Parazon, players can purchase the Essential Parazon mod bundle for Platinum, and it contains all the basic mods released for the Parazon. The mods are Blood for Ammo, Blood for Energy, Blood for Life, Hit and Run, Auto Breach, Live Wire, Failsafe, Untraceable, Master Key, Runtime, Out of Sight, and Intruder. The hacking mods for the Parazon can be found in Spy Vaults, and the finisher mods can drop from the game's bosses. The Parazon can be found in the arsenal and has three basic mod slots if you don't own any Requiem mods. Mods, so once you acquire your first Requiem mod, three more will appear and they are specifically for Requiem mods. More on that later. The Parazon can also perform mercy kills on enemies that are below a certain health threshold, but it's random as to if the mark will appear and even then the threshold is really low at 5% of the enemy's health. The Parazon is also used for hacking now, but only visually, where hacking has a unique animation. It remains the same prior to the update, it's just that little animation that you get. The just mentioned Requiem mods are tied to the Kuvalich systems, once again we'll talk about that soon, but these mods can be acquired via Requiem relics that have a 50% chance to drop from Kuva Siphon missions and have a guaranteed drop from Kuva Flood missions. There are four Requiem relics in the game, with two Requiem mods in each. Requiem relics can be refined just like normal relics, and it costs void traces just like normal relics. Once you have your Requiem mods, they'll have three charges, with a charge being used upon finding the correct combination to kill a Kuva Lich, and then executing that kill. There are eight Requiem mods in the game, those being Lock, Zada, Jahu, Vome, Riss, Fuss, Netra, and Kra. Requiem relics will also contain a new item, that being Riven Silver, and these are used to purchase a Veiled Riven mod from Paladino at the Iron Wake each week. You can only purchase one per week. Now we go to the Kuvalich Nemesis system. In order to start it, you need to go to any level 20 or higher Grinia mission and wait for your screen to flash. Once it flashes, kill as many units as possible and then you will have a Kuva Guardian address you. Once it has done so, a marked enemy will spawn. Kill it and execute it via a mercy kill and then extract from the mission. Once you get back to your orbiter, your Lich will be generated. From there, you can open your Lich menu via the game's menu or navigation screen, and this menu will display all the necessary information for you to hunt down and eventually kill your Lich. The process of this system follows. Open navigation, find the planet with a red blood overlay, run the mission on that node, but you will have to select the generated Lich's missions, but keep in mind playing these missions will result in some of your loot being stolen upon extraction, but all loot will return to the player once you kill your Lich. When you get in mission, unique red markers will appear above enemies, and these markers indicate your Lich's thralls. You will have to kill them and interact with them, perform mercy finishes on them, and doing so will grant you progress towards unveiling one of the three Requiem mods required to kill the Lich. DE have added a 5% chance for Kuva or a Requiem Relic to drop from mercy killing a thrall, so you may get some of that. The Requiem unveiling process will be fast for the initial two Murmurs, those being the first two Requiem mods required and the third will require 70 Murmur kills to get it cleared, but it will require some investment. Murmur progress will also be granted when you attempt to kill your Lich and fail, and it should also be stated that console players do not have the Lich trading system or duplicate protection as of this update's release, so if you're getting duplicates, welcome to the club. Once you unveil all three of the Requiem mods required to kill the Lich, you'll need to take a guess at which mod order will get the kill. They can be in any of the order of the unveiled relics shown on the screen when you unveil them. You can order them in your Parazon's modding screen once you acquire them. To have the Lich spawn, you'll need to kill his Thrall and clear his influence by playing the red nodes on the star chart. He has a higher chance to spawn, the higher his anger bar is in the Lich menu, and once you fight, if you have the wrong combination, he will defeat you, increase in rank, and escape. But if you defeat it by guessing the correct combination, you'll be granted a choice. Either finish it off and gain his randomly generated Kuva variant weapon, or convert it, which will have it spawn in missions at random times to assist you. But you will not get the weapon. Each weapon is unique as it will have random elemental stats and bonuses, plus it is a Kuva variant of the already existing weapons. Those weapons being the Karak, Quatark, Ogres, Com, Tonkor, Dracoon, Twin Stubber, Seer, Kraken, and Brock. The Karak has increased reload speed, lower recoil, and better accuracy. The Quatark fires automatically from the hip and reloads faster. 
The Ogress fires detonite-infused casings semi-automatically from a smaller clip while also dealing greater damage per shot. The comm has a higher fire rate than the original, and with every shot fired in rapid succession, the Kuva comm will release an additional bolt and grow more lethal. The Tonkor has increased reload speed. The Dracoon sends volleys of intensely hot shrapnel ricocheting around the room that do not slow down. It also has a larger clip size and reload speed, and it can be fired in wide or concentrated bursts. The Twin Stubber has a higher fire rate and clip capacity. The Seer has a higher fire rate and magazine capacity with superior zoom capability, plus the projectiles will have a small corrosive burst. The Kraken will fire three shots with a single pull of the trigger, or you can alt fire and send the whole clip out of the gun. It will have higher fire rate, magazine capacity, and reload speed. And lastly, there is the Brock, which is a semi-automatic hand cannon that delivers a lot of punch in a small package with a higher fire rate, magazine capacity, and reload speed. What I just read was what they have over their original versions. Now, three new weapons are also tied to the Kuva Liches, and they are the Chuck Her, which is a high damage flintlock rifle that does additional damage on headshots. The Shield Egg, which is a massive hammer for smashing and the Aanga, which is an arc gun that can be turned into a heavy weapon with a gravimag, just like other arc guns in the game. Kuva weapons will use your normal Riven mod for that weapon, but their dispositions are different to that of the other variants of said weapon, so your Brock now has a different disposition to that of your Kuva Brock. Duplicate but more powerful Kuva weapons can also be used with your already existing weaker versions via Valence Transfer. This process will appear on the same screen as Polarization once you have a duplicate Kuva weapon with higher stats. Undergoing this process will simply transfer any invested former, any invested former potatoes etc onto the more powerful variant. You won't lose any of it. The random status chance will increase to the same percentage as that normal weapon. That transferred weapon will also be destroyed. The Kuvaliches also have a 5% chance to generate with an Ephemera, and upon their death or conversion, the Ephemera will be rewarded. In total, there are 7 new ones. Thanks. The Kuvalich Hunter Collection can be found in the market for 835 Platinum and provides players with a copy of each of the new Requiem mods that I just mentioned, a Radiant Requiem Relic Pack, as well as the exclusive to this pack, Kuva Zevok Shoulder and Chestplate, the Kuva Mevek Chestplate, the Kuva Cred Chestplate, the Kuva Tyreg Shoulder and Chestplate, the Kuva Arang Chestplate, and the Tolan and Stra Leg Plates. There is also 7 color palettes in this bundle, once again exclusive to it, and they are desaturated versions of already existing palettes, where they're under the title of The Undying, Agony, Hatred, Fear, Conquest, Rot, and Darkness. Mentioned throughout the previous pack was also the Radiant Requiem Relic Pack, and that can be purchased individually in the market for 85 Platinum, where it contains one of each Requiem Relic in the game. For companions, there is now the Euphrates Pet Armor Pack that costs 150 Platinum, and it comes with a Tigress-themed armor for your Kavat and Kubrow, with each armor being sold separately for 90 Platinum. Primary and secondary Exler slots have also made their debut with this update. They cost 20 platinum each, but can be purchased as a blueprint from the syndicates in the game for 75,000 standing. The crafting costs are 25,000 credits, a former, a single, exceptional sentient core, and an Oricon cell. The blueprint can also be acquired as a reward from your Requiem relics, and ZE has commented on their addition to the game, where they said, These adapters will be for your primary and secondary weapons only. Once we have finished making changes to the melee system, we will reevaluate the need for a melee variant. The conversation of tight capacity already exists, without the addition of the Exilus weapon mod slot, so we're making the mods default polarities meaning all Exilus weapon mods are Naramon or Madurai, V or Dash. If you're familiar with the Exilus mods, they are utility or movement mods, not sustained DPS grants. The following mods are the eligible Exilus weapon mods that sustain the utility intention. Anything not included in this list was deemed DPS affecting and not true utility. So the mods you can use are Ammo Drum, Shell Compression, Trick Mag, Primed and Standard Rifle Ammo Mutation, Primed and Standard Shotgun Ammo Mutation, Primed and Standard Pistol Ammo Mutation, Arrow Mutation, Sniper Ammo Mutation, and Vigilante Supplies. There's also Eagle Eye, Broad Eye, Overview, Air Recon, Aero Periphery, Agile Aim, Snapshot, Spry Slides, 
Gun Glide, Double Barrel Drift, Stabilizer, Vial Precision, Strafing Slide, Steady Hands, Guided Ordnance, Narrow Barrel, Targeting Subsystem, Hush, Silent Battery, Suppress, Soft Hands, Twitch, Reflex Draw, Lock and Load, Tactical Reload, Eject Magazine, Terminal Velocity, Fatal Acceleration, Lethal Momentum, Adhesive Blast, Cautious Shot, Fomorian Accelerant, Kinetic Ricochet, and Tether Grenades. They've also made the following changes to stats and mod drain to the aforementioned Exilus mods, so that follows. Shell compression and ammo drum have been increased to plus 90% ammo, and vial precision is now at minus 90% recoil. Lock and load, tactical reload, eject magazine, and vial precision are now at a mod drain of 9. Cautious shot is at a mod drain of 10. Rifle ammo mutation, shotgun ammo mutation, arrow mutation, and sniper ammo mutation are all at 7, and their prime variants are all at 10. You can now also purchase up to 6 mod or cosmetic config slots with each extra slot costing 10 platinum. In order to purchase these you will need to go to their respective menus and click the plus icon. In order to do this you must be at least mastery rank 10. The Vasco Cavat has also been added into the game and you can acquire it by taking your Cavat into the Plains of Eidolon at night and having it interact with a wild Vasco. From there you will need to imprint it and breed two together. The conservation vendor Master Tiasani in Cetus has a cure for the Vasca Cavat if you don't want your Cavat infected, but she has also got the required conservation tools to find the Vasca as well as to conserve it. She also has Fluce since the Vasca has been added to the conservation system. The Vasca can be acquired via the market via the Vasca Cavat starting kit for 105 Platinum, as it includes an incubator core, 10 Cavat genetic codes, 6 DNA stabilizers, a stasis slot, genetic code template, and 2 Vasca imprints. This new Cavat has two new precepts as well, and those are Vampiric Bite, where the bite bypasses armor, draining her prey of life, and adding it to her own. And Transfusion, where when her master is in bleed out, the Vasca sacrifices some of her health to raise them. Now next up we have the Catch Moon changes. They've decreased the fall off damage from 100 to 10, decreased the range of the projectile from 40 to 20 meters, and the fall off range has gone from 20 to 30 meters to 8 to 16 meters. Please note that we are monitoring item usage for other weapons who use similar projectiles, aka the Fulman and Archiplasmal, but we will provide notice before we consider changing anything. We are simply monitoring at this phase. As for arbitration changes and fixes, this has been coming a long time for you guys, about 3 months or 2 months. Rewards will be awarded at the same point per game mode as the standard variants with the exception of excavation variants. This means survival would now grant rewards every 5 minutes, defense every 5 waves, interception every round, and so on for the remaining game types. When it comes to excavation, they have reduced the drill timers to compensate, and rotation rewards are now A, A, B, B, C, C, and and so on, which means the same time invested is needed. A new item sculpture, a Vitus Essence decoration, and a bundle of 10,000 former has been added to the arbitration offerings, and they have also added Vitus Essence to the drop table of arbitration drones. Once dropped and picked up, a notification will be displayed. A bundle of three Vitus Essence has also been added to the rotation drop table on rotation A, rotation B, and rotation C. New Aura mods and Arcanes have also been added to the game mode's rotation drop table, and those mods being Aerodynamic, Swift, Momentum, Shepherd, Combat Discipline, and Melee Guidance. As for the new Arcanes, they are Arcane Primary Charge, Arcane Blade Charger, Arcane Pistolier, Arcane Bodyguard, and lastly Arcane Tanker. Items within the Arbiter's Offering Store have had their prices increased by 1.5 times, and players have had their Vitus Essence stockpiles increased due to this. In regards to Arbitration Disruption missions, Digital Extremes have reduced the Conduit Extraction requirement to that of 4 completed Conduits. The Defection mission now rewards every second squad saved. There is now an Extraction Available pop-up that will be displayed upon reaching 4 Conduits when you complete a round in Disruption. Vigorous Swap and Rolling Guard have been move to the arbitration offering store, and as for the arbitration fixes, they have fixed the round counter missing from the UI, and tweaked the Vitus Essence pickup to be larger and red. 
Titania can now transfer to her operator during Razor Wing. Titania's casting animations are now all upper body only, except for Razor Wing, and they've also trimmed the cast time of those abilities. Thorn's Tribute now has damage reflected and reduced. Titania can now spawn up to four more Razor Flies if all tributes are active, with one per tribute. Razor Flies can now pick up tributes and enemies directly affected by Titania's Lantern will now have any damage they take dealt to them when the ability ends. Gauss's abilities have also seen changes. For his passive, they've increased the shield regeneration speed buff from 80% to 120% max. They've increased the battery charge rate from moving by 25%, so going from 0 to 100% at full sprint now takes 20 seconds versus 25 seconds previously. The battery will no longer drain during the Sanctuary Onslaught Zone Teleport. Gauss's Spectres will start with 80% battery and they've fixed the battery gain not taking vertical velocity into account. For Mark Rush, it now grants 1% battery charge per enemy hit during the dash. They've increased the battery charge rate during continuous run by 33%. You can now jump from the ground while running without cancelling the dash. They've added small synergy with Thermal Sundot, so running through a bubble will now add its damage to your dash and impact burst. They've fixed the ability screen showing distance per energy and unintentionally applying both efficiency and duration under the hood, which resulted in energy drain not matching the UI when you had duration mods. They've also changed the energy per meter stat into energy per second, unmodded energy drain remains the same, and while speed mods previously increased energy drain, they now no longer do. Thus energy drain will either be the same or better than before, never worse. As well as the brightness getting toned down for thermal sundars. For kinetic plating, they decrease the battery drain from damage by 33%, and while kinetic plating is active, melee weapon hits will grant a small amount of battery charge. For thermal sunder, they increase the bubble duration from 4, 6, 8, and 10 to 6, 9, 12, and 15. They also increase the minimum radius from 33% max to 50% max, and they split damage into two stats for cold versus heat, and they increase the heat mode damage by two times. They've also removed the Blast Damage stat, so the Blast Damage will use the damage of the mods you are applying, so Cold or Heat, plus the additional damage for cancelling the status. The Blast Armor Removal has been increased from 0 to 50% to 0 to 100%, and Blast Armor Removal will now apply before the Blast Damage is dealt, causing it to be more effective. For Red Line, they increase the Red Line Percentage Gain Rate by 33%, increase the Projectile Seek Chance from 33% to 50%, and increase the Passive Balance battery drain by 33%. For the general changes that occurred for Gauss, they added new sounds to Gauss when his red line is filled and when it has been exceeded. They fixed aim glide applying while holding aim with a sword alone during Gauss's mark rush, allowing you to become Zephyr, apparently. They fixed jumping while using Gauss's mark rush across water giving you no height, which resulted in you getting wet, and they fixed slash status effects dealing full damage to Gauss while kinetic plating is active, so now status damage will be determined by current damage reduction at the time the status occurs. DE has made tone mapping changes where they said, our goal with the changes to tone mapping is to alleviate fatiguing images by introducing darker mid-tones. Things may appear more washed out in contrast to how it was before, but don't worry, it's all intentional. If you spot things that are out of the ordinary and are real whack, please let us know. In saying that, they also show the on-screen screenshot, where it's showing before the update, and now they have the after shot, which is showing after the update. Ember has received a reworked kit. Her passive now increases her ability strength by 5% per enemy on fire within 50 meters. The first ability Fireball remains the same, although casts do get stronger the more it is casted. On top of this, the cast time gets reduced and the damage of the ability gets increased based on the new ability Immolation and how much of the meter is charged. The second ability is now Immolation, as just mentioned, and it has replaced Accelerant. It acts as a damage reduction enhancing charge based ability. A heat meter appears on the right side of the screen, and you will need to manage this meter. The higher the meter, the more damage reduction is granted, and the higher damage your other abilities will deal. However, if the meter reaches its overheating stage, the ability will start to drain more energy. 
Immolation's meter can be increased by casting Fireball or the new fourth ability Inferno. The meter does have negative returns as mentioned beforehand, as if you reach the overheat levels the energy will start to drain faster. To manage the meter's level you will need to cast Fire Blast, as it will expel heat from the meter or of course you can just toggle off the ability and turn it back on again for a complete reset. Fire Blast casting time has also been reduced and the ability now strips armor from nearby enemies with the armor removal being affected by immolation levels. Lastly, there is Inferno, which has replaced World on Fire as the fourth ability. Inferno, when cast, sends comets flying down onto enemies Upon impact with these enemies, they will be set alight and start burning with rings of fire. If other enemies come in contact with the ring, they will also catch fire. The damage of the heat area effect is also affected by immolation levels. Now with those changes to Ember's kit, three of her augments have changed. Flash Accelerant is now Immolated Radiance, and it allows allies within the affinity range to receive 50% of the Immolation's damage reduction. Fire Fright is now Healing Flame, and it makes it so each enemy hit by a Fire Blast heals Ember by 25 to 50 based on the level of the Immolation meter. Lastly, Fire Quake is now Exothermic where enemies killed while under the effect of Inferno have a 15% chance to drop an energy orb. As for Vorbin, who has also seen a rework with the update, Tesla Grenades has been replaced with Tesla Nervos. Upon activation, Vorbin sends out a roller that latches onto nearby enemies, electrocuting them. The ability can be held down, and doing so will cast more rollers that have the same function. Mine Layer has remained a kit ability, but has seen its tools changed into Tether Coil, Flechette Orb, Vector Pad, and Overdriver. Tether Coil pulls a number of nearby enemies to wherever it sticks, rendering them immobile. Flechette Orb fires high-velocity nails in all directions, inflicting puncture damage to nearby targets. Vector Pad lays down a walk pad that grants a boost of speed in a chosen direction. And Overdriver will latch onto a nearby ally or yourself and increase the damage output. The third ability is now Photon Strike, and when it gets cast and thrown onto the ground, it has a small charge up time before a orbital strike occurs. As for the fourth ability, it is now a combination of Bastille and Vortex. Casting the ability will produce the Bastille that suspends enemies within the field into the air, stripping their armor over time. Players who end up within the Bastille will receive a temporary armor gain based on the amount of units within the ability. Once the Bastille's duration ends, it will convert into a Vortex, which will suck the enemies inward. Players can also activate the Vortex prematurely, or simply cast a Vortex by itself without Bastille by holding down the cast key. Although a single cast of Vortex can only occur if there aren't any Bastilles active. Now just like Ember, Vorbin's augments have seen changes. Tesla Bank makes it so any damage dealt to an enemy with a Nervos attached will be absorbed by the Nervos and channeled into a 8 meter burst of electricity upon death. Photon Repeater makes it so if Photon Strike hits at least 5 enemies, the next cast will cost no energy. As for Repelling Bastille, it makes it so enemies within the Bastille will have a 100% chance to be repelled every 4 seconds on top of Vortex duration getting increased by 70% of its maximum duration for each additional Vortex thrown in. It's a combination of the two previous augments that were available for each of those abilities. Now, for Conclave players, both Ember and Vorbin have been removed from access in the Conclave game mode. Now, as for the general additions, they have added two new achievements, those being the Abyss Gazes and That Which Kills You Makes Us Stronger. The Abyss Gazes into you is Create a Kuvalich, and That Which Kills You Makes Us Stronger is Vanquish a Rank 5 Kuvalich. The Zeloid Prelaid boss fight has returned permanently to the game and can be accessed after buying the key blueprint from the market and rebuilding the keys. Its boss node can be found in the Derelict. A new Mastery Rank 28 test has been added for those who can rank up. The Arsenal UI has been updated with new tabs on the left side of the screen for instant access to Arcwings, K-Drives, Conclave loadouts and the normal Warframe loadouts. Melee weapon stats have also been expanded with this update, with a lot more information in regards to each melee weapon. The health bar for the Zealot Prelaid boss fight has been added to all bosses in the game except for Jackal, Vor, Lechkrill, the Raptor, Hyena Pack, Ambulus, and Lephantis. 
They have also added an infested category to the dojo decoration list, added a tip to the look link screen that indicate that sigils are not applied in look link. They've added an option to fast travel to the clan vault decoration. You can now reset main room decorations in your orbiter. However, you will have to type in reset room as confirmation. They've added day form and night form icons beside the emissive color selection in the Equinox's appearance screen. So choosing a dark or light color for your emissive will change what form you spawn into a mission as, and this gives a nice little identifier for it. They've added the Yo scale to the Shorzen, added new fast whooshing sounds to the Pathicist, a subcategory on the player profile stat screen called Most Used Equipment, and they've added two new tips regarding Gauss's abilities. For Nightwave, the Emissary Boss rewards will now only be revealed at the end of the mission screen to prevent aborting the mission if you didn't receive the part you wanted, lowered the Zeloid Prelade and Zealot Bastion's codex scans from 30 to 3, removed the Zeloid Prelade and Zeloid Bastion from the Simulacrum due to it breaking functionality, and they fixed the Zeloid Prelate walking in place if it's killed without picking up a lose flame. For the Shorzen, the chat button can no longer be rebound in the Shorzen controller bindings, and if the button has already been bound due to not having the restriction previously, rebinding it in those settings will fix it. They've changed the name Vibrato to Wemmy when using the Shorzen. They fixed the ability to pet your Kubras or Kavat while using the Shorzen emote. Always seeing the Dak Shorzen when playing the emote after purchasing a Shorzen for the first time. Selecting things in the Shorzen song menu, cancelling the Shorzen emote. Certain buttons, resetting Shorzen songs. And they fixed chat functionality in the Shorzen screen. For general changes, the Kuva Siphon and Kuva Flood missions now appear in the Alert tab. The Options screen, I attend, Treasure screen, and Dojo Room Options UI has been updated to the continued rollout of UI 3.0. The loading screen now puts you all the set at the forefront in a new formation. The Grenier Galleon tile set has been partially updated with new lighting and textures. The Teco now gains additional status chance when you use Atlas or Atlas Prime. Each Kavat can now get you three imprints. You can now enter your dojo from the clan screen when visiting someone else's dojo instead of having to return to your orbiter. You can now double click on a dojo decoration to place it, rather than being required to select a decoration and hit the place decoration button. They've increased the volume of Lua's Rescue Alarm. They've increased the Exposing Harpoon mod's duration from 10 seconds to 15 seconds. They've swapped the Kuva Bombard's Crimson, Dervish, and AT Endo Drop to Condition Overload. Allies will no longer attack Synthesis targets, thus giving you full control on if you want to scan them. And they have said weapon stats will now be reflected in a slightly more rounded way. Continuing further. In a damage is added before anything on the weapon happens, boosting the weapon's base damage and then renormalizing the damage percentages. This makes elemental mods stack in a way you would expect. They have also moved the tips section in the arsenal upgrade screen to the button bar at the bottom, increased the additional item drop chance of the Gas City Hidden Rooms Amalgam enemies from 2% to 4%. The Riven Cycle screen now gives you the option to view the Riven stats on every own variant of a weapon. ZE have changed the way Orokin cells can be farmed via Hyena units on the Razorback mission only, where they said the following. An Orokin cell farming exploit was brought to our attention by not only players, but our internal flagging system when such a method is tripped for misuse. In short, players were forcing the Hyenas to spawn infinitely by entering and exiting rooms, knowing that their Orokin cell drop rate is 100%. As a result of this misuse, the Orokin cell drop rate for the Hyenas in the Razorback mission will diminish the more you spawn to still allow for multiple drop attempts, but without giving away the entire cake. Atlas's Rumbler summon will now create a burst of rock when summoned or de-summoned, and the Prime's tectonic rock wall now has a Prime appearance. They've also increased the Neptune Lamedia disruption credit cash rewards based on feedback, so Rotation A is now solely a 100% chance for a 2x 10,000 credit cash. Rotation B, 100% chance for a 3x 10,000 credit cash. And Rotation C is now a 95% chance for a 5x 10,000 credit cash. Veiled Sentinel Weapon Riven mods can now be equipped on any Sentinel weapon type instead of a specific type. They've also made it so all Veiled Sentinel Riven mods are now titled Companion Weapon Riven mods.
They have updated the terminology for aim glide and latch time to aim glide and wall latch duration. Terrorist vocals will now be ducked more when an Onco transmission is playing. They tweaked the lighting in the loading screen with your Lisette flying around. They updated reflections in Capturer scenes. Orga mod set bonuses will now continue to grant more overshields up to the maximum amount of overshield. Operator ear accessories will now be visible when the Saturn 6 mask is in the closed position. Ghoul purge inbox messages will no longer automatically open your inbox or play the transmissions if you have completed all of the encrypted journal fragments. I do have a video covering what they are up on the channel, so if you just check that on the channel, you'll know what it is. They've also tweaked weather patterns in the Plains of Eidolon to prevent lengthy rainy periods. They've increased brightness of Ash's Blade Storm marks slightly to improve visibility. Ally NPCs will no longer attack Garuda's Blood Altar victims. They've updated the Umbra Former's description to properly reflect the items it can be installed on, and they have removed the ability to use it on K Drives and Arcwing Melee. They have tweaked Ostron eyes to make them less glowy. Enemies may now react to you by stopping and looking around if you shoot a silent weapon within 2-3 to three meters of them several times quickly. This will not change their alert state. They've also made it so applying a look link to the same item that uses default colors will now properly apply the default color. The Norg, Mothers and Grenier mask now have a higher chance of appearing in the CAC store. At the moment of writing the script, I had to get to purchase them, and they look like what you're seeing on screen, as well as the displayed prices that you can buy these for from Nakak. Sentinel Rivens will no longer have the with an active pet requirement, and DE has replaced that requirement on existing Rivens with the without dying or becoming downed requirement. They have removed reflection textures from operator heads to reduce shininess. Revenant's Reave ability is now an upper body animation only. They've increased the Glaive's radial sound so its bouncing can be heard, and they made the following change to the Nightwave Silent Eliminator Axe description to clarify that the minimum enemy difficulty level must be 30+. Plus. So that act now reads... Complete an extermination mission with only level 30 or higher enemies without triggering alarms. Airborne resistance from mods is now capped at 90% to prevent stacking past 100% in some cases. They've reduced minimal range at which Demolist Markers hide when close to the player to 5 meters from the previous 8. They have specifically listed the Vaporize changes that came with Atlas Prime's release. So Vaporize's base damage is now 600 and multiplies with mods equipped to your Sentinel gun. Vaporize's max range has been increased to 30 meters. They have decreased the cooldown to 10 seconds from the previous 30. Vaporize now has punch three and can hit multiple enemies at once. And they have updated the effects of Vaporize. They've corrected instances of possessive contraction in localization, updated terminology for damage types in Portuguese, Tweaked melee sounds for scythe, nunchaku, and hammer weapons, and if a mod is rewarded during an endless mission, the battle or extract screen will now display how many of that mod you currently own. They've also improved the clan emblem removal inbox message to provide more clarity, and they have removed overzealous blockers preventing players from going fast. The only changes that have occurred at the moment in regards to Riven mods is in regards to the stats affecting channeling. They have been converted to affect the combo counter or heavy attacks. As of recording this video, DE has stated no channeling disposition changes will be occurring at launch. Manual blocking has returned and can be done in conjunction with the return of the melee state by holding down the weapon switch key and aiming down sights. You can leave this melee state by pressing your weapon switch key once, and it will return you to your primary or secondary weapon. Blocking now prevents all incoming damage from affecting the player, but all weapons have had their blocking cones adjusted. The stats for each weapon's cone will come later in the video when we go over some weapon changes. Combo attacks can now be cancelled at any point by rolling. There are currently two types of rolls tied to your melee state, so if you are blocking, your roll range will be reduced, and if you aren't blocking, you'll have the standard roll range. All melee combos and stances have been simplified, and categorized to suit the attack. So standing still will have attacks that don't propel you forward, just as moving forward won't have attacks that stop you. DE explained the groups of attacks and their requisites by saying the following, quote, we also wanted melee attacks to feel more intuitive. For example, if you are aiming down the sights of a primary weapon or blocking incoming fire, and then hit the melee button, you most likely want to get in close. 
If you are not inputting a movement key while meleeing, it's usually a sign you want to finish off your target. We want the new combos to reflect that existing movement, and so the new inputs reflect that situational awareness. They continue with the categories. The forward combo is moving forward while meleeing. This allows you to attack without initially interrupting movement with the first 1-3 to three swings, depending on the weapon's stance. The last attack in the sequence will loop seamlessly into the first, so you can keep a level of mobility while attacking. Forward Tactical Combo. It's moving forward while blocking and aiming, and of course melleeing. This move is usually a distance closing opener, bringing you closer to the enemy and getting you within range to continue a harder hitting string of attacks. The beginning or end of this combo can have a slim effect, allowing you to control the enemy, and during the midpoint of the combo, attacks will be large and sweeping, allowing multiple enemies to be hit. The neutral combo, it's simply pressing the melee button. Hard hitting, movement free attacks to allow a player to destroy their target. The last attack can either have a knockdown effect or throw them into the air and hold them there if one set of strikes does not finish the job. Neutral Tactical Combo, this is blocking and aiming while meleeing. The first hit will likely be a longer thrust or throw of a weapon to increase range. Further attacks will be hard hitting and will often finish in a ragdoll effect or a lifting attack, as opposed to a knockdown or stagger. The Air Combo, this is meleeing while jumping. Perform a combo in the air without sacrificing movement, and then you have Hover Air Combo, which is going backwards while meleeing while jumping. It holds the player in place while the combo completes and overrides the slam attack angle to keep the action going. Combos can now lead into other combos if the requirements are met, so you don't have to get stuck in a single combo animation. The combo counter has changed from what it was previously, and is the main mechanic supporting the new heavy attacks that have replaced channeling. Once again, channeling has been removed with this update, but armor effects will appear after the combo counter reaches 2, for those that like the prime effects. The combo counter now increases with every strike, bullet block, slam radial damage, and glaive hit. They've also stated that combo progress will be increased more if you use slower strikes than that of swifter strikes. The combo counter will be consumed upon the activation of a heavy attack regardless of count, but the progress within the counter will affect the damage output of the strike. Warframes and their abilities who use the combo counter will now scale at 25% of their former values, and DE have also added a combo duration bar to the UI that will be displayed under the existing counter. Heavy attacks can be executed while pressing your alternate fire key while in melee. These attacks can be done on the ground or in the air for a slam attack. Heavy attacks can be executed without any points in the combo counter, but no extra benefits will occur if you do that. A heavy attack on the ground with points in the counter will see increased damage to the strike, but if done in the air for a heavy slam attack, any impacted enemies that did not die will have the new lifted status thrust upon them. The lifted status suspends enemies in the air with its effectiveness being tied to the combo points in the counter at the time of activation. In relation to that, the standard slam attack ragdoll has been removed with the exception of the Jack Katarg and other large weapons. Now enemies affected by a slam will be pushed back or knocked down. Slam effects have also been updated to have new visuals. Melee weapon functionality, mastery rank, damage, and overall stats have also been changed with the update. The following are the updated stats and changes provided by DE, as well as their breakdown. So for mastery rank, they explain. Weapons have been reviewed to make sure their function and power are aligned with an appropriate mastery rank, similar to passes made on primary and secondary weapons. For base damage, they said, since the combo multiplier will apply to heavy attacks only, the base damage of all melee weapons has significantly increased. For base range, along with damage, range has also been increased to make sure you get the most chop for your buck. While base range is being increased, range mods are going to have a different calculation applied to them. And lastly, they explained for mod and arcane channeling functionality. As mentioned above, any mods or arcanes with functionality tied to channeling have had their stats altered to increase lifted status, heavy attack damage, and combo counter modifiers. This also applies to Rivens. For universal stat changes, the range has increased for kick attacks to 2 meters, except for sparring weapons, which have been increased to 2.5. And the base combo duration across all weapons has been increased to 5 seconds. For weapon classes, Dagger's parry angle is 45 degrees, and their follow-through has been set to 0.9.
Dual daggers have a parry angle of 50 and the follow through of 0.8. The fist weapon parry angle is 50 with a follow through of 0.9. Sparring weapon parry angles are set to 50 with a follow through of 0.9. Claws have a parry angle of 55 and a follow through of 0.8. Nunchaku parry angle is 55. The Warfan's parry angle is 55 with a follow through of 0.7. Gunblade's parry angle is 45. Rapier's parry angle is 60 and then a follow through of 0.7. In regards to Glaives, DE has removed self damage from their power throws. They've also made it so the power throw mod has been changed to not create explosions when hitting an object or enemy on its last bounce. It solely offers a punch through addition. DE said the following, quote, As this decision made it through the testing pipeline, some mention this impacts a specific chroma interaction, but positively impacts 41 other warframes, end quote. That's all they said in regards to that. Glaive's parry angle has been set to 55 and their follow through is now 0.7. Nakana's parry angle is 55 and the follow through is 0.7. Two handed Nakana's parry angle is 55. Sword and whip parry angles are 60. Tonfa's parry angle is 60. Polearm's parry angle is 55 and the follow through is 0.6. Starve's parry angle is 60. The Scythe's have a parry angle of 60 and their follow through is 0.6. Heavy Blade's parry angle is 55. Hammer's parry angle is 50 and the follow through is at 0.4. Machetes have a parry angle of 55. Sword and Shields have a parry angle of 70. Swords have a parry angle of 55. Dual Swords have a parry angle set to 60. And Whips have a parry angle of 45. Now, as I mentioned a bit before, DE have gone and changed the whole mastery rank requirement for a number of weapons. So in the grouping of mastery rank zero to three, we have the following weapons as well as their stat changes. So this once again is zero to three mastery rank groupings. Ceramic Dagger. The damage has increased from 35 to 140. The range has increased from 1 meter to 1.8. The status chance has gone to 20% and the critical chance to 10%. The Heat Dagger's mastery rank has been increased to 3. The damage has been increased to 14 impact, 76 puncture, 56 slash, and 62 heat. The range goes up to 1.75 meters. The status chance to 14%, the critical chance to 14%, and the critical damage to 1.6. The Dark Dagger's mastery rank is now 2. The damage has been increased from 35 radiation to 58 puncture, 36 slash, and 60 radiation. The range has also increased to 1.75. Status chance has been increased to 22% and the critical chance went up to 8%. For the Fang, damage has been increased to 108, the range to 1.65 meters, the status chance to 16%, and the critical chance to 8%. For the Mark 1 Furax, the damage has been increased to 90 and the range to 1.25. The Ankaros has gone to a Mastery Rank 2 restriction and the damage has gone to 90 plus a range of 1.25. For the Kogaki, Mastery Rank is now 2, damage has gone to 120, and the range 1.25. The Kestrel saw its damage increase to 84, and the range to 1.2. The Glaive's damage has been increased to 105, the range to 1.25, the status chance to 12%, and the critical chance to 12%. The Cronin's damage has been increased to 130, the range to 2.5, and the critical chance to 10%. The Orthos has seen its damage to 1.75, the range to 3, status chance to 18, and the critical chance to 6%. The Tonbow's damage has gone to 184, and the range to 3. The Mark 1 Bow is at 90 damage, and the range to 3. The Anku's damage has gone to 170, and the range to 2.8. The Gram has gone to 160 and the range to 2.8. The Sindo has gone to 200 damage, the range to 2.6. The Galatine's damage is 182, the range to 3. The Fragor damage is 200 and the range to 2.5. The Magister is 210 and the range to 2.5. The Kama damage has gone to 90, the range to 2.4. The Status chance to 10, Critical chance to 12, and the Critical damage gone to 1.8. The Machete, the damage is 120, range 2.5, status chance 15, and critical chance 10. For the Prova, damage has been increased from 35 electricity to 52 impact and 76 electricity. Range has also gone to 2.5, status chance to 16, and critical chance to 14. Critical damage as well has gone to two times. 
The Silver and Aegis, or Aegis, whatever you want to say, damage has gone to 98, the range to 2.5. The Akin Brunt, 149, and the range to 2.5. The Skana's damage is now 120, the range 2.5, and the status chance 16. Jaw Sword's damage is 120, the range to 2.5, status chance to 18, and the critical chance to 6. The Cronus' damage is 106, the range to 2.5, the status chance to 18%, and the critical chance to 6%. For the Heat Sword, Mastery rank has been increased to 3, and the damage has gone to 147, range to 2.5, and the status chance to 20%. For the Pangolin Sword, Mastery rank is now 3, damage is 150, range is 2.5, status chance is 22, and critical chance is 8%. The Dual Skarner's damage has gone to 120, the range to 2.5, and the status chance to 6 the Nami Skyler's mastery rank is now 2, the damage is 125, range 2.5, status chance is at 15%, critical chance is at 10%. For the Dual Kumar, the damage is now 96, the range to a 2.4, status chance to 15%, and the critical chance has been increased to 10%. Dual Heat Sword's mastery rank has gone to 3, damage has been increased to 147, range to 2.5, and status chance to 20%. The Dual Zarin has gone to 70 damage and the range to 2.3. The Lecter's damage has been increased to 20 Puncture, 25 Slash, and 56 Electricity. And now we go to the grouping of Mastery Rank 4 to 6 weapons. They follow. The Sheev is now Mastery Rank 5, the damage to 270, the range to 1.7, critical chance to 13%, and critical damage has gone to 2.1. The Karist Mastery Rank is now at 6, damage has been increased from 50 Toxin to 30 Impact, 84 Puncture, 72 Slash, and 87 Toxin. Range has also gone to 1.75, and the status chance to 26%. The Okina's damage has gone to 140, range 1.7, status chance 20%, and critical chance to 16%. The Furax is now mastery rank 5, damage to 135, range 1.25, status to 11%, critical chance to 25%, and critical damage to 2.3 times. The Teko is mastery rank 6, the damage to 160, range to 1.25, and for the Obax you have mastery rank 4, damage to 120, range 1.25. The Vanker, mastery rank 4 as well, damage to 140, and range to 1.75. The Ripka's mastery rank is 5, the damage to 173, and the range to 1.75. The Redeemer, damage has been increased to 180, range has gone to 1.7, status chance to 22%, critical chance to 10%, and critical damage is 1.8. The Orvius, the damage has gone to 195, range to 1.3, status chance to 18%, and the critical chance is at 18%. And they've also stated that to suspend enemies like you did prior to the update, you need to block and alt fire. The Nakano. Damage is increased to 142, range to 2.5, status chance to 16%, and critical chance to 16%. The Boltace Mastery rank is at 4, damage to 176, range to 2.5, status chance to 28, and critical chance to 6. The Guandale damage is at 202, critical chance to 28%, passive war to 188. The Sidon is Mastery rank 5 with damage to 225 and range is at 2.9. For the Cero, it is now Mastery rank 6, the damage has been increased to 96 slash and 138 electricity. Range has also gone to 3, status chance to 26% and critical chance to 8%. The Bow is now at Mastery rank 4 and the damage has been increased to 140. For the Amphis, the Mastery rank is at 5, damage has been increased to 1 30 range to 3, status chance to 21, critical chance to 13%, and critical damage to 1.7. The Tipido, mastery rank has been increased to 6, the damage has been increased to 124, and the range has gone to 3. The other daggers, mastery rank has been increased to 4, damage has gone to 180, range has gone to 2.7, status chance to 20%, and critical chance to 20%. The dark split sword in its heavy blade form has had its damage increased to 68 puncture, 52 slash, and 100 radiation, with its range going up to 2.8. The Xenostar's damage has been increased to 80 impact, 68 slash, and 150 heat, with the range going to 2.6, 
status chance to 30%, and the critical chance to 10%. They've also said the following in regards to the Xenistar. Disc duration is now a base of 10 seconds and is increased by the combo multiplier. For the Jack Katarg, damage has been increased to 200, range goes to 2.8, for the Cybia, the damage has been increased to 70 impact, 20 puncture, 50 slash, and 100 cold, with the range going to 2.6 and the status chance to 30%. The Gazal Machete, the damage has gone to 1.78, the range to 2.6, and the status chance to 30%. The Kreska has seen its damage go to 190 and the range to 2.5. The Nami Solo's mastery rank is now 6, damage has been increased to 172 and the range is at 2.5. The Plasma Sword, the mastery rank is at 4, the damage has been increased to 34 impact, 12 puncture, 88 slash and 66 electricity. The range has also gone to 2.5, status chance is now at 18% and critical chance is at 18%. The Maya's mastery rank is now 5, the damage has been increased to 23 impact, 23 puncture, 47 slash, and 65 toxin. Range has gone to 2.7, status chance to 31%, and critical chance to 9%. For the Dark Split Sword, when it's in its other form, it is now mastery rank 5, the damage has been increased to 56 puncture, 28 slash, and 32 radiation, and the range is now 2.4. The Dex Dakra, the damage has gone to 142, the range to 2.5, status chance to 24%, and critical chance to 16%. For the Dual Cleavers, mastery rank has gone to 5, damage to 157, and range to 1.7. The Dual Icor has seen its damage go to 19 impact, 11 puncture, 45 slash, and 47 toxin, on top of the range going to 2.3. The Dual Raza has seen its damage go to 110, range to 2.5, status chance to 10, and critical chance to 25. The Atarax mastery rank is now at 5, with the damage at 129. The Skoliak damage has gone to 150, status chance to 29, and critical chance to 13%. And lastly for this grouping, the Galvacord is now at 210 damage. Now, in the grouping of Mastery Rank 7 to 8, we have the Ractor Dark Dagger, where its damage is now 88 Puncture, 62 Slash, and 96 Radiation. The range is 1.75, the status chance 30%, critical chance 12%, critical damage 1.8. The Ether Daggers is now 6, damage is 224, range 1.75, status chance 30%, critical chance 10%, and critical damage 1.8. The Ancros Prime Mastery Rank is now 8, damage is 128, range 1.25, status chance 16, critical chance 28, and critical damage 2.4. The Furax Wraith Mastery Rank is now 9, damage is 139, range 1.25, status chance 15, critical chance 30, and critical damage 2.7. They've also made it so the initial combo count is set to 20. The Harudu has seen its damage to 130, the range to 1.25, status to 11, and the critical chance to 30%. For the Karudu, the damage is 193, and the range is 1.25. The Ninkondi, the mastery rank of that weapon is now 8, and damage has been increased to 90 impact and 100% electricity. The Gunson's mastery rank is now 8, damage has been increased to 160, and the range is 1.75. The Sarpa's damage is now 160, the range is 1.75. The status chance is 28% and critical chance is 14%. Critical damage has also been increased to 2. The Distressor's damage is 158, the range is 2.5, the status chance is 14% and the critical chance is 28%. For the Endura, the damage is now 200, the range is 2.5, status chance 36, and critical chance is at 10%. The Serata's mastery rank is 7, the damage is now 19 impact, 36 puncture, 52 slash, and 76 toxin. The range of this weapon is now 1.25. The Falcor's damage is 230, the range is 1.3, and status chance is at 34%. The Halakar's damage is 148, the range is 1.2, Status chance is 29% and critical chance is at 17%. The Pathocyst damage has been increased to 262, no other changes were made. The Dragon Nakana's damage has been increased to 188, the range to 2.5, status chance to 22, and critical chance has gone to 22 as well. The Tatsu's damage is 214, the range is 3, status chance is 28, critical chance to 16, and critical damage is now at 2. The Lacera's damage has increased to 
12 impact, 38 puncture, 66 slash, and 100 electricity. The range is also at 2.5 and critical chance at 5. The Mios has gone to 1.77, the range to 2.5, and critical chance to 19%. The Oma's damage has been increased to 76 impact, 38 slash, and 110 electricity. The range is also at 2.5. The Kasheg, the damage is 241, the range is at 2.9, the status chance is at 23%, and the critical chance is at 19%. The Puppacist is at 284, the range is at 2.7. The Legion's Mastery rank is now at 9, the damage is 237, the range is 2.7, the status chance is at 37%, and the critical chance is at 15%. The Broken Scepter's Mastery rank is at 7, the damage has been increased to 179, and the range is at 2.9. The Cost Assist damage has been increased to 17 Impact, 71 Puncture, 69 Slash, and 103 Corrosive. The range of this weapon is also at 2.9, the status chance at 37%, and the critical chance is at 9%. For the hate, the mastery rank is at 8. Damage has been increased to 230, range to 2.8, status chance to 20%, and critical chance to 30%. The Sindo Prime's mastery rank has gone to 8, damage has been increased to 250, range to 2.7, status chance to 24%, and critical chance to 26%, on top of the critical damage going to 2.4. The Helio Cause damage is now at 280, the range of the weapon is at 2.5, the status chance has been increased to 12%, and critical chance is at 38%. The Sancti Magister's damage has been increased to 240, the range has been increased to 2.6, status chance to 20%, and critical chance has been increased to 30%. The Volnus Mastery rank has been increased to 9, the damage of the weapon is 220, and the range is 2.9. The Wolf Sledge has been increased to 259 as its damage and range is now at 3.1. The Prisma Machete's damage is 193, the range is 2.5, the status chance 31%, critical chance 15%, and critical damage is at 1.9. The Prova Vandal is now Mastery Rank 8, the damage is 80 impact and 118 electricity, with a range of 2.5, with a status chance of 32%, critical chance at 14%, and critical damage at 2. The Other Sword's Mastery rank is now 7, the damage is 192, range 2.5, status chance 34, and critical chance at 10. The Single Dark Sword is now Mastery rank 8, the damage has been increased to 120 puncture, 60 slash, and 80 radiation, on top of the range going to 2.5 and the status chance to 40%. The Prisma Scarner is now Mastery rank 8 as well, with damage 170, range 2.5, status chance 16, critical chance 28, and critical damage at 2.2. The Croker is now Mastery Rank 9 with a damage of 217, a range of 2.5, and a critical damage of 2.3. The Dual Carries is now damage of 115 with a range of 2.5. The Twin Basalk's Mastery Rank is 7. The damage has been increased to 55 Impact, 15 Puncture, 58 Slash, and 85 Heat with the range of the weapon going to 2.4. The Dual Ether has gone to Mastery Rank 8, the damage is 180, the range 2.5, status chance 28%, critical chance 20%, and critical damage at 2. The Dual Kamas Prime is now Mastery Rank 8, the damage is 160, range has been increased to 2.4, status chance 25%, and critical chance to 20%. The Prisma Dual Cleaver's Mastery rank is now 9, with a damage of 133 and a range of 1.7. The Sakura Lecter's damage has gone to 30 Puncture, 66 Slash, and 80 Electricity, with a status chance of 30% and critical chance of 15%. Now we go to the grouping of Mastery rank 10 and 12. With the Fang Prime, where it is now Mastery Rank 10, the damage has been increased to 178, the status chance to 26%, critical chance to 26%, and critical damage goes to 2.6. The Taco Prime now does 180 damage and has base range of 1.35. The Kagaki now does 242 damage, has a range of 1.25, and status chance of 38%. The Prisma Obex Mastery Rank has gone to 10, with the damage increasing to 150 and the range goes to 1.25. The Shaku is now Mastery Rank 10, the damage is 180, status chance 34, and critical chance at 18%.
The Redeemer Prime now does 212 damage. The range is 1.75. The status chance is 30% and critical chance is at 24%. The Distress of Prime's damage has been increased to 170, the range has been increased to 2.5, status chance to 20, and critical chance is now at 32%. The Glaive Prime's damage has been increased to 164, the range is 1.25, and the critical damage is now 22%. The Skiajati's damage is now 175, range is 2.7, status chance 30%, critical chance 19%, critical damage is 2.1, and the slam radius of the weapon is now 6. The Nakana Prime is now Mastery Rank 12. The damage has been increased to 198, the range to 2.5, status chance to 28, alongside the critical chance going to 28%, and critical damage is now at 2.4. The Jack Kassar's Mastery Rank is now 11. The damage has been increased to 79 Impact, 13 Puncture, 45 Slash, and 81 Heat, alongside its range going to 2.4, and status chance to 19%. The Telos Boltace Mastery Rank has been increased to 11. The damage has gone to 210 range to 2.5, status chance to 35%, and critical chance goes to 20%. The Vakor Sidon's mastery rank is now 11, the damage has been increased to 213, the range has been increased to 2.9, status chance to 33%, critical chance to 21%, and critical damage to 2.5. Radial Blind will also trigger when you block and alt fire at a full charge. The Orthos Prime has been increased to Mastery Rank 12, the damage is 234, the status chance is now 36, the critical chance is now 24, and the critical damage is 2.2. The Bow Prime Mastery Rank is now 10, damage is 176, status chance 32, critical chance 24, and critical damage has been increased to 2.6 times. The Tipido Prime's damage is now 170, and the range is now at 3. The Reaper Prime's Mastery Rank is now 10, the damage has been increased to 200, the range to 2.8, the status chance to 25%, critical chance to 35%, and critical damage has been increased to 2.5 times. The Paracesis' damage has been increased to 222, range to 2.9, and status chance is at 22%. For the War, the damage has been increased to 250, range is at 3.2, status chance is at 26%, and critical chance for the weapon is at 26%, alongside its critical damage going to 2.6. The Architytron's damage is now 360, the range is 2.6. The Sinoid Heliocore's damage is 280, range is 2.6, status chance 40%, critical chance to 16%, and the initial combo for this weapon is now set to 20. The Fragor Prime's mastery rank is 12, the damage has been increased to 270, the range is 2.6, status chance to 18%, and critical chance has been increased to 40%, alongside the initial combo count being set to 30. The Machete Wraith's mastery rank is now 11, damage is 211, range is 2.5, status chance is 33%, critical chance increased to 19%, and critical damage is now at 2.1. The Cobra and Crane's damage is now 296, with a range going to 2.6, and critical damage to 15%. The Sigma and Octantis damage has been increased to 174 and the range is 2.5. The Silver and Aegis Prime's damage has been increased to 318, the range to 2.5, status chance to 30% and critical chance to 25%. The Broken Wars damage has been increased to 187, the range to 2.5, status chance to 20%, critical chance to 35% and critical damage has been increased to 2.2. The Dakra Prime's mastery rank is set to 10, damage has been increased to 170, range to 2.5, status chance to 18%, critical chance to 36%, and critical damage has been increased to 2.4. The Skarna Prime Mastery Rank is now 12, damage is 210, range is 2.5, status chance is 26, critical chance is 26, and critical damage is 2.6. The Twin Crocker is now Mastery Rank 10, damage is 250, range is 2.5. The Nami Skylar Prime's damage is 180, range is 2.5, status chance is 34%, critical chance is 22%, and critical damage is 2. For the grouping of Mastery Rank 13 to 15, we have the Vanker Prime. Where its mastery rank is set to 14, the damage has been increased to 188, the range to 1.8, status chance to 24%, critical chance to 32%, and critical damage to 2.6. 
the Ninkondi Prime's mastery rank is now 14, and the damage goes to 234. The Cronin Prime's mastery rank is 13, the damage is 212, range is 2.5, status chance is 34%, and critical chance is 22%. The Galatine Prime's damage has been increased to 280, the range has been increased to 3, status chance is 26%, and critical chance has been increased to 26%. The Grand Prime has been increased to 300, and the range is 2.9. Now we go to the Zort changes. The Bala part as a dagger has seen its damage go to 224 and the range to 1.7, and the Bala as a staff has seen its damage increase to 224. The Uthla sword variant has seen its damage go to 224 and the range to 2.5, and the staff variant of the Uthla has gone to 224. The Mi Wham sword has seen its damage go to 224 and the range to 2.5. For the polearm variant of the Miwam, it is now 244. The Syaf Machete variant has seen its damage go to 230 with a range 2.6, and the polearm is now 248. The Dahat Rapier is 224 damage and 2.5 range, with the polearm of the Dahat going to 244 damage. For the Crunch Machete, the damage has been increased to 234 and the range to 2.4. The polearm variant of the Crunch has gone to 250 as its damage. The Plague Kripath Rapier has seen its damage go to 213 and the range has been increased to 2.5. As for the Polearm variant, its damage has been increased to 230. The Plague Kiwa Scythe has seen its damage go to 309 and the range to 1.7. The Plague Kiwa Staff has seen its damage go to 262. The Set Farm Nakana has seen its damage go to 226 in the range to 2.5, as well as the Staff variant of the Set Farm going to 226. The Rub V Machete is now 234 damage with a 2.4 range, and the Hammer variant of the Rub V is now 252. Lastly, there is the Doc Ram Scythe, where its damage is now 308 and the range is 1.8, and the Doc Ram Heavy Blade is now 286. In regards to mod rebalancing and functionality, DE said the following before announcing all the mods that saw changes, where they said, Since the base damage of melee is being buffed, some notable mods are getting a balance or functionality pass. With the wide amount of changes happening to channeling and heavy attacks, some mods have had to be reworked into other systems or have had changes to the way their damage scales. For full transparency, some of these are nerfs to specific mods, but we felt these were necessary to truly allow Phase 2 to be treated as a new beginning for melee. Our intention is to create engaging melee and modding variety which is not possible when there is one best loadout or single mod that can kill almost anything in the game. We love killing things effectively, but we also want the combat to be engaging and feel powerful. Spin attacks still exist, but the repetition of them is something we're trying not to force you to use. To reiterate, select tools made spin attacks optimal at the cost of the more interesting melee system, and we're trying to rectify that. So the mods that saw changes and DE's explanations for them do follow. Amalgam Organ Shatter is now plus 85% crit damage and plus 60% heavy attack wind-up speed. Blood Rush will now scale differently using a stacking multiplier based on the combo counter, raising 60% per combo counter tier. Condition Overload now uses a stacking multiplier based on how many status effects are on the target at 120% damage per status. DE expanded on Condition Overload's changes, saying the following. During this whole melee rebalance, Condition Overload remained a persistent outlier. Since launch, it had an unintended stacking mechanic that nothing else uses in the game. It grew exponentially, making it too volatile to balance. We know there's nothing worse, and how can you call this unintended? So let's explain the history. Initially, it did the stacking on final damage, which as you know from previous changes, we have been trying to move away from. This is because this type of stacking makes for very hard to control damage progression, and tends to be very confusing as to which damage, melee proc, etc. applies where. This new version of the mod makes Condition Overload's damage multiplication become equal to pressure point at two statuses applied, and from there it just grows and grows. Even though the maximum potential is lower now, we think it is still an extremely powerful mod in its latest iteration. They've also said the new lifted status also counts for condition overload calculation. Revised stances and the new heavy attack give reliable ways to apply status to enemies, which greatly increases the reliability of condition overload. So that's what they said in regards to condition overload. Now we move on to the other mods.
Corrupt Charge adds a large amount of the combo counter but significantly reduces the time it takes for the combo counter to drain, plus 30% initial combo with minus 50% combo duration. Covert Lethality remains a dagger mod for now with a plus 16 initial combo and 100% finisher damage. Dispatch Overdrive increases player movement on a heavy attack hit with plus 60% movement speed for 15 seconds. Enduring Affliction increases the status chance on enemies suffering from the lifted status with plus 100% status chance on lifted status effects. Enduring Strike increases the combo counter chance when hitting lifted enemies plus 20% additional combo count. For the Focus Energy mod it adds electrical damage to an attack as well as increasing the combo counter generation with plus 40% melee combo efficiency and plus 60% electricity. Focus Defense adds an additional 20 degrees to a weapon's blocking angle. The Gladiator mod set bonus adds a multiplier with a combo counter up to 60% for the whole set. Guardian Derision will add more to the combo counter for blocking hits and the taunt mechanic does remain in place and it has a 15% taunt range on top of the plus 30% combo count chance while blocking. Killing Blow increases heavy attack damage by 120% and decreases the wind-up time for heavy attacks, plus 60% heavy attack wind-up speed. Life Strike heavy attacks will now generate health with plus 20% life steal at max. Maiming Strike changes from an additive buff to a stacking buff, but the base functionality has increased to 150% critical chance on slider attack. The Quickening mod now grants plus 40% attack speed and gives plus 20% combo count chance. Reach and Primed Reach have also changed and DE said the following as to their change. Quote, Reach and Primed Reach will now increase range in a way that has been normalized. In the previous incarnation, long range weapons were getting too much of a benefit, while short range weapons were barely seeing any increase at all. The Reach mod provides 1.1 meters and the Primed Reach mod gives 3 meters. Reflex Coil increases combo point efficiency when using heavy attacks, plus 60%. Reflex Guard provides plus 100% combo count chance while blocking. Spring Loaded Blade will now provide a maximum of 2 additional stacks of melee range, plus 1 meter of range for 24 seconds on the status effect. True Punishment adds 40% critical chance, but reduces the chance to add to the combo counter by minus 10%. And lastly, Weeping Wounds increases status chance in a stacking multiplier, 40% per combo tier. Now the update also brought changes to Weapons Arcanes and Focus School buffs in regards to their special functionality, and those follow. For Xenurix Inner Might, it has been changed to provide 60% combo efficiency instead of channeling efficiency. The Sinoid Heliocore, Furex Wraith, and Fraggle Prime have all received bonus initial combo counts to offset the boosted channeling damage they had previously, which we did go over when we were talking about the stats for those weapons. Exodia Triumph's Arcanes have been changed to plus 50% chance to increase the combo counter on hit. The Exodia Valor Arcanes have been changed to plus 200% chance to increase combo count when hitting lifted enemies. And Exodia Brave Arcanes now grant plus 5 energy generation when killing an enemy with a heavy attack, which can stack up to 3 times. Now all melee based exalted weapons have also received phase 2 functionality treatment where they gain access to the combo changes. So for Garuda's Claws, the parry angle is now 60, range is 2.2, and damage is 180. For Desert Wind, parry angle is 60, and range is 1.2. Exalted Blaze parry angle is 60, range 2.8, and heavy attacks have been added to it. Valkyrie's Claws parry angle is now 60, and the range is 1.7, and for Iron Staff, parry angle is 65, and heavy attacks have been added. Lastly, we have the following in regards to Aim Assist and a little bit of functionality. Aim Assist has been updated to have more intelligence for those that use it. These changes will only apply if Aim Assist is on. DE said, as a general rule under the new system, Aim Assist will be disabled for almost all attacks in the forward and tactical forward combos, and enabled for most of the neutral and tactical neutral combo attacks. End quote. And lastly, in regards to Melee 3.0 Phase 2's rollout in Update 26 The Old Blood, we will no longer drop items or unequip gear items when either equipping melee or when we use a melee attack. For optimizations, DE have optimized the engine startup slightly, made micro optimizations to core math libraries, to content update and game loading, to level loading and eliminated a bunch of harmless log warnings, 
effect rendering and they made micro optimizations to loading into the orbiter and dojos. They've also fixed a game hitch when picking up a stance mod in mission, an effect hitch when casting Korra's Strangle Dome, a soft lock when opening chat, they made minor performance improvements when killing infested crawlers, fixed a possible UI lockup when attempting to contribute to incomplete solar rail research, petting Kubrow's causing loss of functionality, a loss of functionality if an enemy attempts to activate an alarm on a previously hacked panel, the game crashed crashing if it fails to synchronize your inbox on login, a crash that could occur if a squad mate summoned a spectre and then quit the game, a crash when placing a waypoint on certain objects, when changing maps in the conclave among other rare cases, a crash due to corrupt data that could occur when updating, an issue where you could crash if your loadouts had a defunct vehicle slot, a crash related to melee, when selecting a loadout if your loadout name contains HTML characters such as less than in the name, a crash related to ragdolls, they made sweeping optimizations to the script runtime. Script errors fixed a script error when cycling a Riven mod that is not currently selected in the collection grid category. When casting Gara's Mass Vitrify, joining the hunt from Samaris, trying to start the Chimera prologue or apostasy prologue, or the Glass Gambit quest. People getting a script error when attempting to purchase an item that doesn't have multiple purchases available. When selecting the W config on Worm Prime's appearance, which loads into the Wormiest minigame. When viewing the options script screen when auto-installing mods on Sentinel weapons, a loss of functionality if you fail to complete a trade in Maru's Bazaar, a script error that could occur when exiting hacking, when initiating a hack in high-level missions, and when loading into a mission. Now before I read the fixes every console received, I will quickly note the specific fixes per platform. For Xbox One, DE fixed the Jade Bombix sign done clipping through some warframes. For PlayStation 4, DE fixed a crash caused by loading into the game while being on the home screen and then returning to the game. And for Nintendo Switch, DE made the following list of fixes and improvements. New USB voice functionality, a new keyboard dictionary, and it will also include improved shader and audio performance, made improvements to SD performance that will hopefully help players connect to each other in public matchmaking, fixes to multiple crashes, black screen issues when loading into missions, jittery animations on all airborne and flying units, and a controller lockup that would result in players only being able to cast abilities after switching to their operator and back again. DE has also stated they made fixes towards texture, flickering, issues for the Nintendo Switch. And to finish the console patch note video off, we had the fixes. So DE fix not being able to hit certain enemies with projectile weapons or if your shot started too close to them. Nova's antimatter drop exploding prematurely when aiming with your gun and looking down a bit. Korra's whip claw healing enemies instead of damaging them when equipping mods for negative puncture impact. Synth fiber not working correctly when equipped on Venari. Hitting an enemy caught in Strangle Dome with your whip claw not transferring damage to other foes held in the Strangle Dome if you're a client, an exploit with Titania's Razorwing and Syndicate weapons, Titania's Dex Pixia not being equipped if Razorwing is cast while holding an arc gun, Saren Spores costing no energy when casted if the Venom Dose Augment is equipped, Saren's Venom Dose Augment effects not properly applying to allies, Saren's Malt not properly cleansing her of Nox's Sludge, Mesa being unable to use abilities or melee when using the Venka after casting Peacemaker, Anaris's Negation Swarm Augment mod not preventing any status effects from applying to the player after using the arsenal in the simulacrum, Titania's razor wing not showing the number of razor flies active after returning from the operator, some pixelation on Vault's chest, Wisps, Motes not keeping their energy color when picked up by a non-Wisp player, Wisp not aiming her rifle when firing upwards, Gauss, Korra and Wukong's custom HUD warping oddly when in dual wield mode, some HUD buffs such as Mirage's total eclipse duplicating when the player transfers to their operator and the buff value changes, Mag Prime appearing super glossy, the Etheria armor set clipping with many warframes and skins, a number of different operator accessories excessively clipping with the Norg mask and Mother's mask when the hood opens Open is selected, a hole in the Harrow Hyphora helmet, the Etheria shoulder plates appearing misaligned on Mirage Prime, Gara's Zamaru's helmet dangles not applying the chosen energy color, the massive Prime Cyan Dana not sitting properly on Wisp, Mace's immortal skin not appearing properly to Mesa Prime, the Cryono Cyan Dana clipping with some Warframe stances, the Catch Moon kit guns, Archiplasmor, and a few other weapons not being able to damage the Roper Lawless Cyanovia, the Lua lens appearing as the same basic lens icon in the Arsenal inventory 
screen. Operate is running on air as a client if you use transference just as you're falling off a level. Clients being unable to see theirs or the host glyph when deployed in mission. Enemies on dropships popping into view briefly for clients. Enemy health bars remaining yellow on armored enemies that have their armor reduced to zero for clients. Clients in Arcwing not seeing the projectile incoming message. Cases of client operators transferring back to their Warframe and being unable to use Warframe abilities. The foreman's detached barrel lingering for clients after switching weapons. Enemy ragdolls sometime going wild for clients when they are killed by Excalibur's radial javelin. Clients Warframes continuously firing the quads after transferring to the operator. Clients Riven challenge progress not being tracked if a host migration occur. The Icarius not homing in on enemies when playing as a client. Momentum carrying over when bullet jumping and immediately entering the void after. The inability to complete the mastery rank 12 test if you fall off the starting platform. Teleporters in the featured dojo sometimes teleporting you back to your own dojo. The red visual marker hint for Damalus not appearing in the gas city. They fix the Zello prelate walking in place if it's killed without picking up Arlo's flame. The ability to equip arcanes you do not own through mod link. Chat linked veiled ribbons not showing the unveiling challenge information. Veiled companion weapon ribbon issues when chat linking. Warframe look links applying to operators, incorrect operator hair icons, an unintended fire rate increase for the Acceltra when jumping, an exploit tied to the Tano Spectres, cases where enemies would be standing around idle in Sanctuary Onslaught instead of storming towards you, Nightwave buttons appearing dark when accessing menus in operator mode in the orbiter, Warframes running at a weird angle in Conclave, growing power aura effects not triggering when equipped on Excalibur Umbra after transferring to and from the operator, camera panning through the ship when accessing the the focus tree via the arsenal, terrorists and other boss enemies taking more damage to weak points than they should, unowned barrow offerings showing credit cost instead of ducat value in the void trader screen, enemy tenno minimap markers showing up as white in the conclave, enemies in the simulacrum not recovering from stomp cast by a rhino spectre, issues when previewing cosmetics in the arsenal that are a part of a bundle, a waypoint marker not updating to the closest enemy in the arcwing exterminate missions, crawlers pathings to help them stop getting stuck, infested units sometimes preferring to vomit projectiles when they have the opportunity to melee their target instead, the in-construction dojo decorations sometimes going invisible, missing jog callouts for the golden moor section of the War Within quest, void dash not applying movement in the War Within or if you try to use it immediately after transferring to the operator, K-Drive race is not appearing properly on the minimap when using the default K-Drive from the Vox Solaris quest, they fix the hostages in the rescue the hostages missions during the Vox Solaris quest, not all behaviors behaving in the same cowering way, missing audio cues in the Chains of Harrow quest, enemies not spawning in the first half of the final mission in the Arcwing quest, misleading objective markers in the final Arcwing quest mission, remaining players being unable to complete the Mask of the Revenant Spectre flight after a host migration occurs, Hunter Synergy crit chance boost not actually being taken into account when rolling for crits for pets, Eidolon Hunt Bounty showing Veiled Rewards, Ivara's Empowered Quiver stat display saying Critical Chance when it should be Critical Damage, the Arcane Primary Charger, Arcane Blade Charger, Arcane Pistolier and Arcane Bodyguard not listing the plus one Arcane Revive at max rank, Arcane Blade Charger displaying the damage increase factor being 2% instead of 200%, the inability to complete the Kuva Fortress defense mission if you nix mind control a turret, the random Relic Login Reward text displaying Relic Pack instead of Relic, Seeing a gear prompt when switching from the trading screen to the emote screen, missing localization for the aim glide and latch duration in the aerodynamic mod, allies losing their title impunity buff if you cast title impunity elsewhere, doing too much damage to corrupted Vor causing him to become invincible and stuck in an animation, the arc gun animation playing when swapping weapons in an arcwing mission, note beacon text not appearing for orbiter guests, the inability to use warframe abilities or transference if Atlas's titanic rumblers or mod is activated due to bindings, the Tusk, Thumper, Doma and potentially others sometimes jumping away and despawning, Arcane Pistolier not giving infinite ammo at 100% efficiency for weapons that fire more than one bullet at a time, an issue that prevented donating your last of a type of Iotan sculpture to the clan vault, a few places where players would get stuck where they would previously be able to move freely, some NPCs crouch walking preventing their pathing from being completed in some cases, submersible water clipping through levels where there's no swim 
swimming are loud, zip lines kicking you off if you bump into geometry instead of just stopping you short of overlapping, which also fix colliding with other players or enemies on a zip line when you should be able to pass through them, certain cases where kills were leading to achievements, completing twice as fast, gas city dropships potentially despawning before you ever had the chance to see it, they made fixes towards Condor dropships in the Valis getting stuck in the sky and refusing to drop off their units, the start elevator appearing unlocalized at the bottom of the elevators in the plains of Eidolon, Amalgam's not dropping the additional Kavats Grace, Antigrav Array, Gale Kick and Onomatic mods, Mace's Peacemakers not firing after holding down fire while rolling with Mace's Waltz equipped, the inability to unveil multiple equipped ribbons at once that have similar challenges, cases where each kind of relic wasn't available for a Void Fisher mission, there will now always be a Void Fisher mission available for each relic error, missing gear item descriptions in the gear wheel, corrupted Vore appearing poorly lit one showing up to the party in the void, misaligned firing from the plinks, the taco prime rotating in your hands each time you change the colour, removing the decorations that you've just placed resulting in the item not stacking in your inventory with the ones you already own, and shot up as i10 sculptures until you refresh the screen. Decoration mode scaling incorrectly, a potential fix was made for the inability to move around in decoration mode. Sometimes seeing rank 61 in the Nightwave tune in screen, not seeing your platinum credit balances when viewing a chat linked item in the game market, an enemy icon flashing very briefly on screen if you skip introduction cutscene when going to the relay, seeing your cavat dissolve when viewing a cavat mod link, the inability to view K drive scrolls in the market when you don't own a K drive, the ability to walk around in the vehicle arsenal screen, experiencing a hitch when opening the in game market, the inability to see the katana holster options when the blind justice stance is equipped, the combat discipline mod killing warframes that are invincible, the combat discipline mod causing a white screen if your warframe dies because of it while controlling the operator. They fixed becoming unarmed and unable to get your weapon back while in Revenant's Dance Macabre, a case of Atlas's rumblers not getting destroyed upon spamming the ability, Kuva disappearing from the last mission results after closing and reopening it, paused enemies in the simulacrum sometimes getting stuck in weird animation loops, a large amount of spot loading when changing loadouts in the arsenal, the mecha mod set bonus being applied to the Helmuth charger, exiting the custom obstacle course dual room, not returning the player to the room, having to restart when visiting the mod screen through the arsenal during the tutorial before you've unlocked the mod segment, they fixed operator amp slots showing up in the market before you've completed the second dream quest, changing from a loadout with natural talent equipped to a loadout with natural talent in the simulacrum not updating your cast speed, running on an angle when attempting to run straight in a conclave, your Kubrow or Kavat appearance always being config A when loading into the orbiter until you enter the arsenal, a floating NPC in the Hydroid Relay, cases where your arc wing is invisible during a flying cinematic, players always seeing your operator's clothing config A customization when viewing your profile, Condrox flying away too early during the takeoff animation, certain enemies not maintaining their velocity movement after you unpause in Capturer, the inability to read the full stat list of mod link weapons due to it having multiple alternate firing modes, tickers bundles not displaying their prices and being fully greyed out if you don't own some of the items in the bundles, names doubling up in the chart member list, the staticors charge shot firing rapidly a large number of times when ammo is fully depleted while using Mirage's Hall of Mirrors, the Baltimore Bravura skin being overly jittery, Moa lockers being infinitely hackable, the inability to fire your moat amp as the operator after switching back and forth in your gear wheel, the Pyrana Prime's passive not animating correctly, the Graham and Graham Prime having bad animations when equipped with the Mortier Heavy Blade skin, the inability to see Hun Hao during the second dream opening cinematic, an inability to jump after firing the Sapper and falling off of the edge, Mirage's Eclipse damage buff not increasing the damage of Midas shots and by extension not increasing the damage of slash pox caused by it, missing Spy Vault lasers in the old Valis, your Kavat taking appearance from a previous previously equipped Kavad, the synth reflex mod bonus not activating without a companion, having a 0% accuracy when using the Batacore exclusively, fixes were made towards animation issues when reloading the Boltor with the Boltor Bravura skin equipped, issues with the lighting and certain boss tiles, operator eyeballs having spotty black textures, an issue where you could lock yourself out of renaming configs if you had too many characters in your name, a progression stop in size visual where the Ostron Koffer was behind the Plains of Eidolon barrier, the Lanka Opticore, Helios, Convetrix, and Archiplasmor research missing from the energy lab, the ability to double jump, AI struggling to navigate properly in the simulacrum, they made fixes towards the Vaskukovat's neck textures being separate from its body, focus defense mod description being written in all caps, the incorrect localization text for heavy attacks in the combo screen, sometimes being
being locked out of spawning your K-Drive if you fail to spawn it due to being too close to the planes of idle on boundary, players being left floating if they were standing on an excavator or a capture case when it's destroyed, Hexanon and Oricon cell drops from the Amalgams appearing as mods, the Horus not appearing in the Codex, mysterious planes of idle and fragments showing up in the Codex, Executioner Harkonor missing a description in the Codex, red emissives on the Venus Terra mowers, host revive effects being replicated for clients, the Edo Prime armor not showing electrical effects when your combo builds up, some weirdness with a Parasus projectile effects, part of the melee toxin effect not taking on energy colors, Titania's Denrite Gunblade skin missing its effects, the Nightwave Emissary Assassinate Lantern Illumination effects drastically changing when going through the doorways, and them appearing different when on the ground versus being held. Chorus Strangle Dome Beam effects appearing incorrect, Ash's Blade Storm Mark effects not appearing on Ash, an effect Memory Leak with a Spore Ephemera, the Batacor's Charge State effects not always triggering for clients, certain snowy terrain in the wall within, not playing the right footstep sounds, packs charge sounds not playing properly, they fix kick guns, losing sound when dual wielding and using arc wing, missing sounds for Baruch's desert wind, melee attacks losing their hit sounds when using Gauss's redline and kinetic plating, text on the void fissure reward screen appearing different to read when the chosen UI theme is bright, they fix the reset all decorations in the room option for appearing in the decorations UI when in an orbiter room with no decorations placed, UI bugs when previewing unknown skins in the arsenal and backing out of the menu, slow loading UI when switching between the Warframe options in the Vorprize tutorial quest, the navigation alert bar overlapping your UI when viewing your profile, incorrect mod UI when viewing a Venari mod link, overlapping UI when viewing a look link when in the arsenal, the invite UI pop-up not changing when the menu scale is changed, words not wrapping in the Venus Junction UI, losing Ivara's sleep or cloak arrow UI timer when transferring to the operator, some UI screens not having the correct icons and textures displayed after a level transition, a long-standing issue where the UI might not have refreshed at the moment of an alert, sortie, fissure, etc. mission, if another long-running dynamic mission was also scheduled at that location. They fixed mods given during an endless void fissure mission, covering up the timer on the UI, the mining success UI appearing to have a blocky effect, emblems appearing incorrectly when equipped on a sentinel skin, duplicate color names in the Hino Kubrau Jean masking kit, they fixed a typo in the name of the De Elra Kavat fur pattern, a text string appearing when dismantling servo fish in Fortuna, the title of thank you messages running off screen, a typo in the Jordis Precept fight, spelling discrepancies of armor in the Shepherd or a mod, small grammatical errors in the training section of the codex, they fix the complete X to unlock this act, showing X as broken code for French, duplicate subtitles in transmissions from Davo in Vor's prize, Gauss's collection description having a typo in credit, Vorben Prime's coattails not being replaced by regular non-prime coattails when toggling his prime details, a spawn point in the corpus ship onslaught tile set, a level hole in the corpus outpost ship tile set, a level hole in the corpus outpost tile set, one Monkey plant spawns in the Grenier shipyard tile sets, AI navigation issues in the Grenier settlement tile set due to door framing, corpus consoles being used in a Grenier tile set, AI trying to move through windows in the Grenier C lab tile set, an inability for clients to see waypoints in the corpus ice planet tile set after completing an exterminate mission, a poorly lit hallway in the Grenier C lab tile set, doors clipping through walls in the infested corpus ship tile set, trees with missing collision in the Grenier forest tile set, dropping the data mass off cliffs around the extraction point on the Grenier Earth tile set resulting in the data mass teleporting to an unreachable location, elevator control panels hovering in the air in the Corpus Outpost tile set, enemies spawning inside walls in the Corpus Outpost exterminate tile set, enemies not being teleported when falling into pits in the Oricon derelict exterminate tile set, a hole in the Corpus Outpost defense tile set, a whole bunch of out of bounds decoration meshes that were poking into other tile sets, unreachable loot in the infested Corpus tile set, elite sanctuary onslaught tile set order change changing if a host migration occurs, and lastly, they fixed a level hole in the Grenier C-Lab tile set. So for consoles, if you even got to this point, please let me know once again. It's uh, nice to know that someone, anyone, got to this point. But for consoles, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4, that is your main update so far with update 26.0.6, The Old Blood. Enjoy.